Emma Mijas died a horrible and painful death unnecessarily on her very first Christmas Eve 2004 at the hands of 25 doctors and nurses, another victim of medical malpractice. All 25 doctors and nurses systematically administered the wrong drugs for her life-threatening condition called SLOS. SLOS, smith Limley Optus Syndrome, is a congenital abnormality which requires treatment strategies on supplying supplemental cholesterol. They gave Emma the wrong drug, Questran, not once, but 92 times, yes, 92 times in one month, a cholesterol-reducing drug, not the cholesterol supplemental drug she needed. All of them knew better. They were trained to know better. They were some of the world's leading authorities at the Louisiana State University Health Science Center in New Orleans. But they just didn't give a damn about Emma's life. In 2013, the prestigious Journal of Patient Safety published a study that as many as 440,000 patients die each year from preventable medical errors. That would make medical errors the third leading cause of death in America, behind heart disease and cancer, which is second. These people are not dying from the illnesses that caused them to seek hospital care in the first place. No, they are dying from mistakes that hospitals could have prevented. What are these fatal errors? Who are these incompetent and negligent doctors? A New England Journal of Medicine January 28, 2016 study reported that 1% of physicians accounted for 32% of paid malpractice claims over the last 10 years. The ugly truth is that little is being done to hold these dangerous doctors accountable. Researchers found that bad doctors showed distinctive characteristics, including having paid previous malpractice claims. So it stands to reason that healthcare providers could eliminate one third of medical malpractice along with patients' pain and suffering, as well as the added cost of corrective surgeries, long-term care and indemnity payments by removing the worst 1% of doctors. Why aren't bad doctors stopped from practicing? The answer lies at least partially in the National Practitioner Data Bank, a clearinghouse for information on medical malpractice that Congress established in 1986 to help state licensing boards police the healthcare industry. The National Database was supposed to help states identify dangerous doctors and prevent them from harming more patients, and is used by hospitals, insurers, and licensing boards to track doctors' records check prospective hires and make other decisions. But it is virtually useless in holding doctors accountable because by federal law, none are listed by name. They are assigned a random number to protect their identities. Even if doctors were identified in the data as they should be, the public would still be barred by law from accessing the records. So vulnerable sick patients sit in the waiting rooms of bad physicians without a clue about their poor record of performance. And in many cases, a negligent doctor's insurance company pays the victim of malpractice and the doctor goes back to work. If a doctor develops a bad enough reputation in one town, he can move to a new state and continue practicing. This is unbelievable. But today, the public does not have access to the database to identify doctors' names and addresses to identify doctors with uniquely long histories of being sued or disciplined for medical malpractice. Because on September 1st, 2011, the government cut off public access. What was behind that decision? Apparently, one Kansas doctor with a trail of malpractice suits, Dr. Robert Tenney. The Kansas-based doctor complained to the Government Health Resources and Service Administration that the Kansas City Star newspaper was publishing the story of one of his patients, Mary Beth Chase, who died in 2007 after undergoing a brain surgery with Dr. Tenney. It is also noted that Tenney had been sued at least 16 times for medical malpractice, but had never been disciplined by the state's 
licensing boards. The Insider Exclusive produced a TV story on this case with the lawyers who represented Mary Beth's family when doctors go bad, Mary Beth Chase versus Dr. Robert T. Tenney. Tenney finally settled the Chase family's wrongful death suit for $1 million. The settlement brought total malpractice payments paid on Tenney's behalf since the early 1990s to roughly $3.7 million. In some states, including California, Colorado, Georgia, and New York, patients can go to medical board's websites to find out about doctors' malpractice histories, but not in Kansas and Missouri. In this insider-exclusive Network TV special, Justice in America, Vito's Story, we visit with the family's lawyer, Andy Siegel, partner Siegel and Coonerty, Carmine, Vito's son, and Dr. Steve Bloomfield, a neurosurgical expert. As we take you inside today's legal system, examining the legal strategies, and in vivid detail showing you the often heartbreaking stories of medical malpractice cases. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from New York. It is my great pleasure to introduce Andy Siegel to the show. Welcome to the show, Andy. Thank you, Steve. Tell our audience a little bit about your law firm. What, what do you specialize in? We specialize in traumatic brain injury, whether it be from an accident, such as a construction accident, automobile, or uh, victims of medical malpractice. But we do have a general practice where we represent people with injuries other than brain injuries. Before the show, you were showing me some of the cases that you've handled, and especially, I think there were about eight or nine medical malpractice cases where you initially filed a lawsuit and there was zero offer on the other side, right? Um, these are complicated cases, right? Most are. And as you mentioned earlier, not only do you have to be up on the terminology and what the medical procedures are, you really kind of have to be a head of the medical profession, don't you? Uh, you have to be a step ahead. If you're not, then you're not going to be able to navigate the medicine in the courtroom. We're here today, Andy, to talk about another medical malpractice case you handled and successfully won, um, Vito's case. Tell our audience a little bit about what happened in this case. Vito, uh, 82-year-old gentleman, uh, fell, unfortunately, nobody's fault, hit his head, ends up coming to the hospital facility, CAT scan's done. He has what's known as a subdural hematoma that's compressing his brain or causing what's known as a midline shift. And under these circumstances, what's medically indicated is something known as a burr hole procedure, where the neurosurgeon makes a hole in the skull, evacuates the blood clot, and that's usually all that occurs. In this particular case, after the surgery, um, Vito was not coming out of anesthesia the way one would anticipate. Another CAT scan um, was done. Um, it was read as showing um, a blood collection um, near the tip of what's known as a Jackson uh, Pratt drain. Uh, the drain was removed and um, the son of uh, Carmine um, was told um, his father's uh, neurological situation was one known as a post-operative uh, Todd's aparesis and that he should be okay within uh, 10 days to two weeks. Um, Carmine um, has a bit of a medical background. Um, he saw uh, that his father had um, a hemiparesis on the opposite side of where the burr hole was done, being concerned that his father had something more than just this transient uh, condition. He signed the scans out. He went to another hospital facility. Uh, they were viewed by a, another neuroradiologist who told Carmine that no, his father doesn't have a temporary 
Todd's uh, a paresis, what in fact occurred here was that the neurosurgeon embedded a Jackson Pratt catheter two inches deep into the structure of his brain known as the motor cortex. And what was the result of this? The motor cortex is a highly specialized area of the brain. It's responsible for the initiation and the generation of movement. Meaning if you want to move your arm up, that initial thought process is generated in the motor cortex. Then it sends the neurological signals down the spinal cord into the arm and, and you have movement. What happened here is um, when you do an evacuation of what's known as a subdural hematoma, the location where you create access um, to the uh, blood collection uh, in in the subdural space is very critical and important. Um, what you're supposed to do is enter the um, skull in a location that is not over the motor cortex. Even though the greatest volume of blood is over the motor cortex, you don't want to enter there because of the highly specialized cells of the motor cortex. Where you enter, is frontally or in front of a, an anatomical a landmark known as the coronal suture, which is uh, comes across uh, the head. That way, if there is an injury, it's not to these eloquent brain tissue that make up the motor cortex, but rather to, let's say, tissue of the frontal lobe, which uh, can recover. And so the um, the doctor basically made a major mistake here. And what, what was the end result here? The major mistake made by this doctor was locating his burr hole, the access, right over the motor cortex. And then the second major mistake that was made uh, by this neurosurgeon was when he placed the Jackson Pratt catheter into th the, the brain area. He's supposed to place that catheter into what's known as the subdural space so it can collect post-operative fluids. To do that, you enter the Jackson Pratt drain and you must make sure the tip of the drain actually goes into the subdural space. So you have to make a 90 degree turn as soon as you enter under the skull. Here, no turn was made at all. The Jackson Pratt catheter was embedded, was placed in a hole and went straight down into the motor cortex. What was the end result for Vito? The end result for Vito was that he actually had a medical device embedded into the motor cortex of his brain. For the rest of his life, which involved four more years, he had hemiparesis and was unable to use the uh, right side of his body in effect, for the rest of his life. It affected his movement of his right arm. He was on a liquid diet for the rest of his life because the motility in the throat, that was compromised on the right side. So he would choke on solid foods. He couldn't move his right leg. In fact, because of the compromise um, to the right lower extremity or his right leg, um, he unfortunately at his grandson's all-star game um, fell and suffered a broken hip and we claim that as part and parcel of the damages in the case as well what happened eventually with this case ultimately this case um, went to trial was defended vigorously by defense counsel and i took a jury verdict uh, on the case and this particular verdict ended up being the ninth largest verdict in the history of the particular county um, that the case was brought in. What are the lessons to be learned from this case? The lessons to be learned from this case is that you have to stay on top of the medical care that your family members are receiving, especially if they're a, a bit elderly. Um, most lawyers would not have taken this case because the injured party uh, was 82 years old. Um, my opinion was is that there had to uh, be a sense of justice brought here um, to this gentleman who unknowingly had a catheter embedded in his brain and then the family was never told. Uh, they were told that he had some transient condition. Um, so uh, I had to in effect police 
uh, the medical profession here because they weren't policing themselves. Okay. Uh, fortunately, we have Vito's son here today, Carmine. So let's bring him on right now. It is my great pleasure to introduce Carmine to the show. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, take us back to that day when you noticed, and you have a medical background. You're a chiropractor, I understand. Yeah. Um, take us back to that day when you noticed that something was wrong with your dad, Vito. We see him in post-op. You have a liaison that comes back and forth from the operating room. And my father uh, was finished with his procedure. The doctor came out and said things went well and, you know, goes away. Uh, we get to see him. They said, you know, we'll, we'll, my father had his blanket on. They were keeping him warm. When did you realize that something was really definitely wrong? Within a few days, my father just didn't seem right. His hands were kind of uh, looked deformed. He seemed to not move. He was on heavy seizure medicines uh, because they had told us that my father had a seizure and he'd be okay in a few days. Didn't sit well with me. So I went down and I said, you know, I got copies of his CAT scans that they had taken uh, before the operation and during, I guess, this incident, uh, they took more. Uh, and I sent them to a cousin of mine who's a medical doctor and he gave them to a friend um, who worked at a hospital who was the neuroradiologist at the hospital. And he called me back with the findings and he said, you know, I think, um, you should get Uncle out of the hospital and take him to Columbia Presbyterian. It uh, looks like uh, a drain may have been embedded into his brain matter. And uh, he probably had a hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, these are not seizures that you're seeing. They're not telling you the truth. Right. So you eventually ended up with Andy. How did you find Andy Siegel? I did some research, and I, I, I knew that this was a matter of uh, a brain injury. And I was looking for uh, an attorney that had some background in the field. And um, Andy had done a few cases, uh, you know, that some were high profile, and he did some that fit, in my mind, what I was looking for, where he had spoke about, uh, and you'll see on, in, on his internet site, uh, where he had handled cases with brain injuries before. So I started to do my own interviews, and I would... I saw a few attorneys, and I liked Andy the best. Well, he's certainly knowledgeable. What do you think about the job that he ended up doing for you and your family? I think he did a great job. Andy uh, took the time to learn the case in detail. He, he he was not one to you know prepare as he was walking into the courtroom. Andy called me. He was oh, we were always in touch. He knew every detail of the case. He went over everything thorough with me. Even during the case, he would speak to me um, about, you know, make sure that he had all of his details and facts in order. And uh, I will say one thing about Andy. Andy does know the courtroom. He was excellent with the jury. And I think that had a lot to do with our success. Well, I want to thank you for being on the program. And my condolences for for your dad. Thank you, Stephen. Fortunately, we have your leading expert, your medical expert with us, Dr. Stephen Bloomfield. So let's bring him on right now. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Stephen Bloomfield to the show. Welcome to the show, Steve. Yes, thank you. Would you like to be called Dr. Bloomfield or Steve? Steve is fine, Steve. Um, Steve, you were the expert that Andy had on this case. Can you tell our audience a little bit about what struck you as a grave error that happened to Vito? The surgeon was right in recommending surgery, but there was a liquid blood clot pressing against the brain, and the surgeon performed three or four mistakes in approaching the way the operation was performed. The first most easily avoidable mistake was where he decided to place the opening of the skull called a burr hole, which is a dime-sized opening. There are easy landmarks on the surface of the scalp and the skull to be able to keep you in a safe place to place the burr hole 
in a location that is safe over a part of the brain that is not eloquent. And we know from our uh, anatomy that there are certain eloquent areas of the brain that we could identify the locations of that would be dangerous to operate. Eloquent means really sophisticated areas you really don't want to go in, right? And in Vito's case, his motor cortex, as all people's, is sitting right about here, four centimeters behind a very well-documented, palpable, and easily seen cranial suture, a suture between two bones, the frontal bone and the parietal bone. And our training has always been to stay away from this as if it's a no-fly zone. And to be able to place the burr hole in a location that's very safe. Because if you injured the eloquent cortex in the no-fly zone, the injury would not be tolerated well and it would cause a paralysis on the opposite side of the body. Why did this doctor do this, by the way? I believe it was a mistake that was due to him simply rushing and not taking the proper steps that we learned to measure out the no-fly zone and to be able to ensure that the location of the burr hole was in an area that was safe. By the way, you're an expert in this area of the brain, but you're a neurological expert, medical expert, is that right? Yes, as a neurosurgeon, we have been trained in neurological as well as neurosurgical um, type of uh, evaluations and treatments. You know, we cover a lot of medical malpractice cases, and oftentimes we see doctors that are incompetent, negligent, but it strikes me that this particular case, um, the doctor just totally ignored what he had been taught for many years ago, right? To avoid that no-fly zone. Why do you think he did that? Just because he didn't care or what? Well, I believe he felt it was a easy, safe, chip shot type of an operation and that he probably did the operation so many times in his career that he wouldn't have a problem. But under the circumstances, that hubris, in my opinion, led him to cause harm to Vita. Yeah. When you see doctors sued, and there's a lot of medical malpractice cases out there, um, do you think it's good for the industry, medical malpractice suits? Well, I believe that doctors who are not properly trained or doctors who are properly trained but not following their training who then violate the standard of care need to have some accountability. And right now the medical system's accountability which I get involved with in morbidity and mortality conferences is one form of accountability but it doesn't help a patient's family um, who have an injury that incurs immense amount of medical um, bills to be able to handle the complication that occurred due to the malpractice. You know, oftentimes in these cases, it's, as you said, the battle of the experts. You'll have another expert come in and say the exact opposite of what you're saying. What do you think of those experts, so-called experts? I believe that there are a lot of differences of opinions about when a decision during surgery is medical judgment and when it is beyond the standard of care. And it is, in my opinion, um, very reasonable to have two different opinions and have that set forth for the jury and the, and the judge to uh, consider and be able to work in a way that um, brings justice to bear. But I have to admit, the way the system works, in my opinion, requires doctors um, who are experts to really stretch the truth often. And it's tempting for me, but it's something that I try my darndest to avoid. Uh, in my opinion, it would be far better if the judge would be the person who retains an expert 
and let the experts be equipoised without the bias of being retained by either the defense or the... Take the money out of the system. Yes. That, yeah. In my opinion, that would be preferable. And even more preferable than that would be a system whereby the administrations of hospitals keep track of the morbidity and mortality of doctors and help re, um, report back to the doctors their track records so that they can remediate themselves in ways to regain the standard of care if need be. And then patients who incur complications can have insurances that can cover the costs of those complicate the treatment of those complications that would be preferable but in terms of the legal system it is a necessary process but i would prefer it to be a process whereby the experts are not biased by the retaining um, law firms and that the experts would be retained by a um, a judge for instance and in some states there are judge created panels of experts um, that wind up helping to screen cases and I believe that that that's a step in the right direction. Steve in this particular case uh, the defendant's expert was a spine surgeon not a brain neurosurgeon like Dr. Bloomfield. I think that speaks volumes to the credibility of the plaintiff's case in this particular situation. They were probably hoping that the jurors wouldn't be able to distinguish between a spine surgeon and a neurosurgeon, right? I would imagine. Well, that was a big mistake on their part. It was. Well, I believe that may have been because the case was so bad for the defendant that the defense law firm had difficulty being able to retain a neurosurgeon for the case. All right, well, again, thank you very much for being on the show. I appreciate it. You're most welcome, Steve. You know, a lot of people, you mentioned earlier, a lot of people say, I was injured on, you know, by my doctor. I think I have a claim. What, do you, what exactly is medical malpractice? How is it defined legally? Medical malpractice legally is defined as a doctor practicing medicine okay, where they deviate or depart from good and accepted medical practice and standards of care. Those are arbitrary words. And it is up to the lawyer to prove that they departed from that standard of reasonable care. That's kind of tough sometimes. It's kind of tough all the time. Um, four out of five cases that uh, go to verdict in New York and medical malpractice are lost by the plaintiff. So it's, it's a very high burden because at the end of the day, in most of these cases, it becomes a battle of the experts. Who do they believe? The plaintiff puts on a doctor, qualified, and says that the defendant departed from good and accepted medical practice by doing something he shouldn't have done or by failing to do something that he should have done. And the defendants put on a doctor that says that's not the case. Right. In a criminal case. Oftentimes, when a person is a recidivist, in other words, they've got a record as long as an arm, right? Um, it may get brought up that this person's been in prison and out of prison, and the jurors obviously take that into account because they say, hey, this is a lifetime bad a pattern of conduct, right? In medical malpractice cases, you are not allowed to present any evidence of a doctor who's been sued multiple times, are you? Uh, no, you're not. What, what you could do, okay, and, and it's a very narrow thing, is if the doctor's been sued for the same or similar thing in the past and you have prior testimony, you can use that. But a, a, a prior act- From a different it, trial. Yeah, from a different trial. But it's like an auto case. If someone ran 10 red lights, that's not gonna come into evidence in, in an auto accident case. What should a person do if they suspect medical malpractice in a case, whether it's against them or one of their loved ones, what should they do? The first thing that an injured patient should do or their family members on their behalf is consult with an attorney, not just one attorney. What about getting their records first? I mean, they can get their records first. Most of the time in medical malpractice cases, there's this um, terrible event 
and the people really need to focus on getting better. So if they're out of care and they retain a medical malpractice lawyer, let the lawyer be the lawyer. Let the lawyer get the records, let the lawyer review the records with experts, and let the patient let them heal themselves. Yeah, and I want to emphasize um, that you're, you're part of the profession representing plaintiffs is always done on contingency. That means that if a person is injured and they have a case that you take on, it doesn't cost them any money whatsoever for you to put the case on. That, that's correct. That includes all the investigations. That includes the hiring of experts, which can be expensive. It can. I'm just curious, a normal expert I've heard from start to finish, start evaluating a case to appearing in court can run as high as $25,000. It can. Right? And you got to have two of them. Absolutely. There's no cap in the state on medical malpractice um, cases, right? No cap, but we have an appellate division that keeps things in check. Meaning if they think the case is really out of whack or the verdict, they'll knock it down. Is that right? Correct. Congratulations, you know, on, on the case. And you mentioned earlier how you, how you select clients. You turn down nine out of 10 possible cases. What cases scream out at you that you take on? The cases that scream out at me are just that. They, they scream out at me. It's like a slap in the face. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, look what happened to this person. I can't believe it. That's usually the malpractice case. Okay. I want to thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.